But it's most important in a textbook is not what is in there and what, how they treat what is in there, although, that, yeah, that's important. But what is even more important is what is omitted. High school textbooks reach, I think, the most important part of the population. I mean, that's when the ideas of kids about society, about government, are formed. So this is a very, very important point in their lives. Have a nice weekend, people. Thanks. The history they give in school is so changed. I mean, I was starving for more. I think it's important to know about the world around you and where you're really coming from. What I learned is it's boring, but I learned it. What yeah. do you learn in sport? Because they make you. As a mother, what I found was that my son's textbook was so poorly written and so inaccurately written. It was like it was impossible for him to find information in the textbook because he just wasn't there. And who do you think writes the textbook? I know it's not a black person. <laughs> discussion about Christopher Columbus. They would make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them. Subjugate? And make them do whatever we want. That doesn't sound like a slave trader to you? If you have to um, write a description about what happened when Columbus got here, and then you look in the textbook, you're obviously not going to find out what happened when Columbus got here. It's, it's leaving out the part about what they did to the Indians, about how everything happened, about how everything came together, how did he come over here, why, for what. The fact that he slaughtered the Indians and that the Spaniards raped and killed a lot of Indian, a lot of Native American women, they tend to leave that part out. George Washington had slaves, the father of our country. Well, what's your point? I remember specifically learning about slavery and um, asking, like, you know, why did that happen, whatever, whatever. And it, basically to me it just sounded like they use examples of slavery in other places and was like, that was just the time to have slaves. And it was just, everyone was doing like, it was a trend. So it's kind of like this whole mindset where like, okay, yeah, slavery happened, but you know, we've made up for it because you know, blacks are in a better position than they ever have been. So therefore, I shouldn't question, you know, the economic difference between black and white or rich and poor. So you finally read a book and it's bullshit. Tony. Well, in fact, here's the, the title of this this book, The Triumph of the American Nation. Uh, no, uh, The Triumph of the American Nation is a very nationalistic kind of description and very positive and, and says nothing about the complexities of American history uh, in which, for the most part, you know, the triumph has been the triumph of the, of the, of the wealthy people and the, the powerful people it's, and the triumph of certain groups over other groups. The great myth in this country has been always that we are one big country. We're, and we're all together like one big happy family. And uh, the Constitution starts off the preamble, we the people of the United States, as if we the people of the United States, all of us, black, white, men, women, immigrant, Native Americans, we all establish the Constitution. Not so. We the people how many people here feel like your own ethnicity? You've spent enough time reading about that in history class. <laughs> All right, and if you, how many people here feel like their ethnicity has not, you've not gotten a chance to study that enough? Well, most of, the, most of the students that I teach are Latino or black. The ways in which their histories are in the U.S. history textbook, um, it's, a, it's not a constant presence, and I think that's what the the biggest drawback to traditional texts is that there's never a constant presence of any of the marginalized communities in the text. The constant presence is that white male um, dominance, and that is always there, no matter what chapter, no matter what topic, no matter what page. America was founded by the English, but also by the German, Dutch, and French. The principle still sticks, our heritage is mixed. So any kid could be the president. You simply melt right. It doesn't matter what your skin, it doesn't matter where you are from or your religion. You jump right into the great American melting pot. 
What is interesting to me about the, this textbook, it represents a certain uh, concession to the changes in history teaching and history writing that have taken place since the 1960s when we've begun to have an alternative history, when we've begun to have a, more of a history recognizing you know, women and black people and working people. And so the, the textbook makes nods in that direction. But essentially, what this textbook does is give us a traditional non-class version of American history. By non-class version of American history, I mean uh, there is no real recognition that our society has been divided from the very beginning. You know, from the time of the colonists, you know, been divided into rich and poor. I would agree with Zinn in, in that analysis that there is no social class analysis in, in the textbook. And, and just dealing with our students in particular, we are, uh, we are in a school where um, well over half of the students are are receiving um, free lunch, which means that their families are below the poverty line, um, the poverty level. And our, if you ask our group of students if they're living in poverty or if they are poor or what kind of class they consider themselves, most will actually say that middle class. I worked in the South Bronx for 14 years where large numbers of kids were, were terribly marginalized. It was, you know, the South Bronx was the poorest congressional district in the country. And everyone, almost 100% of the kids, you know, said things about people on welfare, which were in amazing, considering that most of them were on welfare. So it's the schizophrenia of this society, because you're rooting for, very often, the wrong guy. You know, it's like watching a John Wayne movie and knowing, even if you know about history, rooting for the cowboys. Get your lessons. That's what my mom's kept stressing. I try to pay attention, but they classes were interesting. The 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention were a remarkable cross-section of American leadership. The word leadership is very important there. They weren't a cross-section of the American people. They were a cross-section of the American leadership. And what does that mean? That means that these 55 men who drafted the Constitution were a cross-section of the richest people, most powerful people in America. They were a cross-section of slaveholders, of merchants, of bondholders, of land speculators. They were white, they were male, uh, and they owned a lot of money. So that's, that's the group they were a cross-section of. Or to put it another way, the Founding Fathers were not a multicultural group. In 1776, there are three important people in the, uh, among the Founding Fathers, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison. They wrote these articles for the New York Press to persuade people, to try to persuade people, to ratify the Constitution. And the, even the most conservative people in this country agree that the Federalist Papers probably, if there is any body of writings in the history of this country which represents the political theory of the United States, they say, ah, it's the Federalist Papers. The most crucial of these Federalist Papers, there were 85 of them, was Federalist Paper number 10. Uh, there's nothing here, nothing in this textbook about the Federalist Papers. Nothing. Zero. But what do they think? They think that young people are not going to be able to understand the Federalist Papers? No, maybe they're worried that the young people will be able to understand them too well. The Federalist Paper number 10, which is written by James Madison, asks, you know, why are we setting up the strong central government? Well, because we're worried about faction, about the conflict of factions. He could have used the word class instead of faction, but the word class was not in vogue yet. <laughs> so, faction. And what are these different factions based on? These different factions are based, James Madison said, on the unequal division of property. Some people have property, some people don't have property. Or to put it another way, some people have property, most people don't have property. That causes factions. We don't want these factions to fight against one another, Madison says, so we have to have set up a government to control this. Now what are we most worried about? We're not worried about a minority faction, he said, because we're going to set up a constitution where the majority will rule. But what we're worried about is a majority faction. Ah, that's interesting. That means most of the people in the country. That's what we're worried about. It's a democracy, but we're worried about a majority. 
That's why they set up a strong central government. The Republicans and the Democrats, they, they both agree we mustn't have big government. Fact is, we've never had anything but big government in this country. The Constitution set up big government. They wanted big government. They owe, have always wanted big government until government began to do things in the 20th century for ordinary people. And then the cry went up, no big government. like how good the U.S. is, but not the bad about the U.S.? Um, no one wants you to think, you know, America's bad or whatever. Look at the media, look at the government. So. When I went to high school, the period between the Civil War and World War I, you know, roughly between 1865, 1914, 15, that period called the Industrial Revolution was the period in which the United States became a great, great economic power in the world. And what I remember sitting there in high school was how wonderful it all was and how it was presented wonderfully and how the, the country, you know, just zoomed and we were all supposed to be proud, you know, of, of that zooming up into first place just as we're all supposed to be proud today when the Dow Jones average goes up. They talk about the the great pioneers of the new industrial society. They were gamblers willing to take chances in the hope of gain. Highly competitive people in a highly competitive society. These business leaders have often been condemned as robber barons for their selfishness and ruthless business methods, for exploiting their workers and forcing their rivals out of business. Ah, good, a concession. And then it ends up saying, however they are viewed today, these business leaders played an important part in an important period of the nation's development. They helped to give new directions to American life. Well, what are these new directions? Uh, they helped to give the directions to American life, which we are still experiencing today. The increasing wealth at the top and, uh, and increasing troubles uh, down below. Uh, that is, they introduced a, a system uh, of profit making and profit as the chief incentive of the industrial system in which human beings were to be considered secondary to corporate profit. Uh, that's the direction that they set. Today when they talk about the Dow Jones average, they don't talk at the same time about the fact that while the Dow Jones average has gone up f you know, 400 percent in the last 15 years, the wages of ordinary people have gone down 15 percent. Throughout America, a new spirit of fierce competition drove people at a faster and faster pace. It was an exciting and a productive period in the nation's history. I, you know, I, I like to see that. You see people being driven at a faster and faster pace. You see the working people being driven at a faster and faster pace, working longer and longer hours, an exciting and productive period in American history. How nice. Then it says, but some of the changes created problems for many people. Well, that's the greatest understatement that you could have in describing, you know, the Industrial Revolution. The process of textbooks is to take the complex and to reduce it to as simple a sound bite as textbook publishers believe the American public can handle. Obviously, whoever has the most power in society is going to be able to use their power to influence uh, you know, lots of things, including textbooks. So. Teachers are pressured to tell you to think one way. Pressure by administration, pressure by board of ed. Certainly with global history and U.S. history, we need to teach a certain curriculum. Um, and it would be a disservice to the students not to teach that curriculum because they are tested on that at the end of the year. We're in the midst of grading these regents exams and so the principals get pressure from the superintendents or whoever to have a high percentage of the students passing those regents exams and then the pressure gets put on the teachers to teach the material that are going to be on the regents. It's like all of these this pressure to study what's in the book and it focuses on a test. So important things that might not be on the test that you'd want to teach you know you have to sacrifice some places so and you hope that everything falls together but definitely there's a tremendous amount of pressure textbooks probably should be designed to teach toward some testing but checks to see whether or not if you're going to live in this country you know what the constitution's about people who come from somewhere else have to do it why shouldn't people who are born here have to do the same thing so this is a good thing 
Um, on the other hand, when the textbook reaches all the way out to the edges of the margin, so that everything that a textbook does must somehow conform to a test at the other end, it doesn't leave any space for people to pursue the edges, the corners of history, the exciting parts, the fun parts, um, the parts that give individuals a sense of their own place in it. The publishers don't want to offend anybody. Franklin W. Pierce is one of the worst presidents in the history of the United States. He's one of the causes of the Civil War. He was so bad. But he's the only president that ever came from New Hampshire. Now, am I going to say in my textbook, this president sucks. He's my candidate. He actually is my candidate for the worst president of all. Well, I might offend New Hampshire. And then we don't want to say anything bad about the Alamo, or we'll lose the Texas market. We don't want to say anything bad. Well, if you can't say anything harsh or hard-hitting about anything, you can't say anything interesting about anything, because you might offend somebody. So that's what's um, unfortunately happened to the textbook market. The market is, are, is the government, you know, because textbook books are bought by, you know, um, well, for about half the states in the country, it's, it's adoption boards, they're called. They're state boards that buy textbooks, and they have to pass, you know, certain requirements. So their whole thing is, will it get adopted by a state? And the two biggest states that they're worried about are Texas and California. And the reason is because uh, those are the biggest markets. There's all sorts of connections between the publishing companies and the, uh, and, and the Board of Education. If I want to use a text from, for instance, the New Press, if it's not on the approved list, I can't order a class set. I can order a few copies for the library. But if you look at those listings, they're primarily what the large textbook c companies put out. So it's, uh, it's cozy, and it's a multi-million dollar uh, business. Textbook writers, textbook publishers are in a business. They're really not idealists. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're idealists too, but they're really out to figure out how to make a dollar and how to make a dollar in the most competitive way, both in competition with the other textbooks and in competition with themselves to keep their costs down and their profits up. Some of the man executives, you know, they come out with great lines, like one boss said, uh, we're not educators, we're business people. <laughs> you know, thank you, that's a great thing to quote, you know. They seem to only glorify the Europeans, claiming Africans with only three fifths of human beings. They give you large and admiring profiles of these uh, pioneers of industrialism, of Carnegie, uh, of Rockefeller, uh, of Vanderbilt. But you don't get comparable portraits of the people who were on the other side, that large group of people who were, yes, exploited by them, who had to work 14, 16 hours a day in their factories and their oil refineries, who had died by the thousands working on their railroads, the Chinese immigrants and the, and the Irish immigrants. You don't get a picture of that uh, while it uh, uh, glamorizes the founding fathers and the industrial leaders and the military leaders at other points in the textbook. Uh, it uh, treats uh, what I think are the, the true heroes of American democracy uh, in passing ways, or doesn't treat them at all, or in ways which, which distort uh, who they were. No great portrait of Mother Jones. Here's a, a woman who in her 80s organizes miners in West Virginia, talks to the miners and said, you are the ones who have produced this wealth, and where is it? Who has it? Who brings the children of miners, who are working in the mines at the age of 10 and 12, and she brings them to Washington, D.C. to confront Theodore Roosevelt and the Congress about child labor, carrying signs saying, oh, we want time to play. Well, Mother Jones doesn't even appear here. She doesn't exist as far as this is concerned. To me, that's a test, because Mother Jones is one of the great figures of the 20th century. It talks about Emma Goldman, for instance. Emma Goldman, this remarkable anarchist feminist of the early 20th century, the best-known anarchist was Emma Goldman, an immigrant from Russia. Though feared and hated generally by the middle class and disliked by many workers, Goldman was appreciated in radical circles. I like that. Feared and hated. Now, how many workers' opinions 
are they aware of? The fact is that Emma Goldman was a hero to workers. She organized the garment workers of New York and, and, and they assembled in huge numbers to hear her speak in Union Square uh, at times of great deprivation. And uh, she spoke all over the country and thousands of people, thousands and thousands of people came to hear her speak. She was popular among working people. We know who hated and feared Emma Goldman, that's clear. The very rich in this country, the industrialists, the police, <laughs> the, uh, the forces of authority, J. Edgar Hoover, who finally deported her personally uh, at the end of World War I after she'd been in jail for opposing World War I. I mean, those are the people who hated her, but you would never know that from this book. I think our history curriculum, as it is taught today, makes all students stupid. That is, it reduces their ability to think about society. Uh, it does this because it pretty much leaves out causation. Uh, instead, it just teaches one damn thing after another. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression. The New Deal is portrayed in the traditional way that the New Deal is portrayed. Uh, we had a depression. Uh, Roosevelt came along. He fixed things up. How nice. Uh, but what they leave out was that Roosevelt came into office in the early 1933 in the midst of ferocious class conflict in this country. And he came into office in the midst of organizing all over the country, of tenants organizing against landlords, unemployed people organizing, marching on city halls uh, to demand that something be done uh, to help feed their family, demanding jobs because, you know, one third of the, of the working population was jobless. The, this is the situation that Roosevelt faced when he came into office. If you don't understand that, if you aren't given that understanding in a textbook, that in 1934 there were strikes all over the country, uh, turmoil all over the country, I mean, there's class conflict, there's worry in the upper classes. It's under those conditions that Roosevelt uh, goes to work and the New Deal legislation is passed. But you get no indication that it's, the, it's that kind of struggle that has always existed in this country and in which concessions for the working class, for ordinary people have come, not through the beneficence of presidents and congresses, but through the, the turmoil, the protests, the organization, uh, the strikes, the boycotts of ordinary people in this country. If you're intent with like the past history of your own country, then you're not going to want to question things that people do.